Welcome to Brandon Avats. Today we are joined by Paul Witham from Notre Dame University, and we're going to be talking about one of the most famous political philosophers, John Rawls. Paul, would you like to start with a thought experiment? I'd love to start with a thought experiment. My thought experiment involves a game. With apologies to the listeners and viewers who aren't Americans, my game is baseball. That's my favorite game, and it's the one about which I know the most. So that's the game from which the thought experiment will be drawn. Imagine that a group of friends, say 18 of them, are walking across a field. They come across a couple of sticks, a ball, four bags. They want to play a game with them. They have to figure out what rules they're going to use. How would you decide what rules to use? What do you think they should do? Should they let the guy who can hit the ball the furthest with the stick make the rules? Okay. decide how close he's standing to the people who throw the ball to them so that he can hit it as far as he can. Let the guy who can throw the ball past anybody make the rules so that he can get as many people out as he can. Okay. Should we let the people who are most adept at catching the balls make the rules so that they can get everybody out by catching the balls they hit? Any of these solutions is going to yield a set of rules that favors people with some talents over others. So wouldn't the best way to arrive at a fair rule book be to ask the players to imagine that they don't know what their talents are. They don't know how big they are, how fast they are, how far they can hit the ball, how quickly they can throw, whether they're ham-handed or sure-handed. Imagine that they don't know any of that. They've got, wouldn't that be the best way to arrive at rules? What rules would you arrive, by, arrive at to play the game? And, would, and most importantly, wouldn't the rules arrived at by people who pretend they don't know anything about their athletic abilities be a set of rules by which it's fair to play? If your answer to that is yes, if you find this thought experiment compelling, then you've got the central idea, the central thought experiment of the theory of justice put forward by John Rawls, arguably the greatest political philosopher since John Stuart Mill and Karl Marx. Rawls wrote a book called A Theory of Justice, published it in 1971, named his theory or called his conception of justice, justice as fairness. And he called it justice as fairness because he arrived at principles of justice using a thought experiment that's quite like the one I just described, quite like the one by which baseball players would arrive at fair rules for a baseball game. No accident that, Rawls loved baseball. He wasn't a bad player himself. Once gave out that he had played for the New York Yankees during the war, though it isn't true. How he happened to say that is a story we might get to. But he does have, in one of, my, one of his publications that numbers among my favorites, a little article called Why Baseball is the Best of All Possible Games. So it's not too much of a stretch to think that the thought experiment in his book, A Theory of Justice, was inspired by something like the thought experiment that I laid out. I like this idea about thinking about something small, something that's tangible. Many of our viewers are gonna enjoy watching sport and they think about a way in which that game is fair in the sense that everybody has a decent go at it. And that once you know what the rules are, are that you design, that becomes a game that's enjoyable. And if we think about the rules that we want in a society that's just, we don't want them to be designed by those that are the most powerful because they're likely to rig the rules of the game in their favor. So you can imagine that if men are in a society and they're able to make the rules, they might very well want to make rules that favor them, that disfavor women, um, that you could have different racial groups, or different religious groups, if they have knowledge of what positions they are to jig society to suit them. So how does Rawls tinker with this to set up a just set of rules? And what do some of those rules look like? The rules of justice for, that are appropriate for society are those that would be arrived at by a fair agreement, as I sort of suggested when we were talking about the baseball game. In suggesting that principles of justice or rules of justice should be arrived at, or are those that would be arrived at by a kind of agreement, Rawls is locating himself in a long tradition of political philosophy dates back to the early modern period at least, the social contract tradition. Important figures in the social contract tradition are Thomas Hobbes, though he has rather a different take on the social contract tradition than many of his successors. The great English political philosopher, John Locke, 
Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Immanuel Kant. But the theory of Locke, the social contract theory of Locke, illustrates just the, the problem that you're talking about. So Locke imagines people in a state of nature, much like the people I imagine walking across the field. Locke imagines people in a state of nature who need to establish a government. Okay? But the reason that the people in, the state of, in Locke's state of nature want to establish a government is to protect property that they previously acquired. That means that people entering Locke's social contract have property holdings already. The property holdings are different. And the people with property holdings that are more substantial are in a position to write a social contract with terms that are advantageous to them. And so it's not surprising that in Locke's social contract, there's a property qualification for, excuse me, there's a property qualification for vote. Rawls is well aware of the social contract tradition and the problems with a view like Locke's, the problem that you pointed to, of allowing people with power to write rules that would advantage themselves. So Rawls is very concerned to set up his social contract in such a way that that's not possible. There are lots of conditions on his social contract. His social contract is called the original position. There are lots of conditions on the original position and we can talk about them if you like, but the most famous condition on the original position, the one that does the most work and the one that rules out the problem that you're talking about is a condition called the veil of ignorance. Rawls imagines that parties in his original position, in his social contract situation, are veiled in ignorance of their age, their sex, their uh, natural abilities, their property holdings, their ability to do well in capital markets, their entrepreneurial skills, their athletic abilities, and importantly, their views about what's good in life, what's, or we might say what's good and holy in life. So parties who are writing the social contract don't know much about themselves at all and are not in a position to tailor the terms to their advantage. They also don't know what their religious and philosophical and moral views are. And so they're not in a position to draw on those when they write the terms of the contract either. So Rawls is imagining this collection of individuals who are absent of information about themselves. So they don't know any of these details about themselves. They don't know their age, sex, gender, their demographics. They don't know their intellectual cap capabilities, their athletic capabilities, their uh, financial status. But when this discussion is over, the veil of ignorance will be lifted and they will know, and they will land up being someone with a certain financial status. So these are real people. It's just for the purposes of the experiment, they don't have knowledge about themselves for the duration of the discussion. I, I understand that Rawls said they're not exactly real people. They would have to be rational agents and not everyone's a rational agent. So there could be that small issue, but let's put that aside. Once they've had this discussion, Rawls thinks that there's certain principles that will be elicited. Certain principles will come out of this discussion that they will agree on, that are rational for these agents to agree on. What are those principles? Very good question. So Rawls is writing at a time in which he thinks that the philosophy of utilitarianism, which is roughly a moral theory that enjoins producing the greatest good for the greatest number or the optimal balance of pleasure to pain, Okay. is the dominant working philosophy in economics and law and politics, at least in the States and perhaps elsewhere. Okay. He's deeply disturbed by the problems with utilitarianism and thinks that there are lots of problems he sees with utilitarianism that we can talk about, but utilitarianism is the, the view to which he wishes to develop an alternative. And so it's really important that the principles that he develops are quite different from utilitarianism. They don't allow for the aggregation of individual well-being into, as it were, a social whole. The, and we can talk about this more, the well-being of some cannot be traded off against the well-being of others in order to maximize the good of the whole or optimize the good of the whole. Rawls's principles are non-aggregative, we might say. He argues that parties to his social contract would agree to two of them in order. The first of the principles says that everybody is to have the right to the most equal basic liberties compatible with like liberty for everyone else. The second principle has two parts. It says that people to are, enjoy fair equality of opportunity 
and that inequalities of income and wealth are to be uh, arranged so that they're to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged. Now, the second of those principles, and in particular, the second part of the second principle is easy to understand, at least in the States for 40 years or more, people have been talking about trickle down economics and arguing that benefits conferred on the top will make their way down to those in the bottom. They'll trickle down, the rising tide will lift all boats, or so they say. It's really, really important that that's not what Rawls's principle says. What Rawls's principle says is that economic inequalities have to be arranged so that they're to the greatest benefit of the least advantaged. They have to make the least well off as well off as they can be under feasible states of the economy. So it's a non-aggregative view, it's not a trickle down view, and importantly, it's a liberal view. It gives great priority to the basic liberties. Derek Parfit, one of the other great philosophers, wrote this, this volume after 25 years of not having written anything since Reasons and Persons, where he tries to tackle Rawls's account of this difference principle, this idea that we should distribute goods for the benefit of the least well-off. What Rawls is known for is having these graphs where you can have these different kinds of, of people and you could, let's say, allocate uh, units of pleasure or income units to them, and you can have a distribution. And Parfit says, well, imagine these two scenarios. The one is where you've got a society of 100 people, so it's sort of easy to imagine. And 99 of them have a million dollars. And one of them has one dollar. And society two, that person has two dollars and everyone else, the other 99, have three dollars. So if you're a utilitarian, you add up the money and you work out, well, what would be best for everyone? And you say, well, the one with the 99 millionaires seems like an excellent choice to me. The greatest amount of utility has been maximized. Rawls has to say, no, it's the other one. It's the one where the, the least well-off has got double, uh, where he's got $2 instead of $1. And Parfit says, that strikes him as utterly absurd, that it's a clearly bad distribution and that that's a reductio of Rawls's position. It's a bad distribution. I don't think it's a reductio of Rawls's position. What the parties in the original position are asked to do is to choose principles of justice that are going to regulate the ongoing operation of what Rawls calls the basic structure of society. The basic structure of society is a set of all of society's basic institutions taken together. It's educational institutions, political institutions, the family gets included, so do other major institutions that influence the life prospects of individuals. These operate in an ongoing way to distribute income and wealth. And there are some ways in which social institutions operate and other ways in, in which they don't. The parties in the original position know something of the laws of economics and social science. And they know that it's simply not realistic to realistic social science or economics to suppose that the ongoing operations of, econ of an economy can generate any distribution, whatever, that Parfit or anyone else can come up with. And so Rawls, in fact, anticipates the objection that Parfit makes in theory of justice. And he gives an answer which might not be satisfying to everyone and obviously isn't satisfying to Parfit because I'm sure Parfit's well aware that Rawls gave it. But what Rawls says in effect, is, look, economies just don't work that way. It's not as if these are two possible feasible states of the same economy. And what we're looking for are principles that will regulate economies as they act or societies as they actually work. If you say, look, there's these underlying mechanisms that are going to result in these different distributions between people. And I can tell you with some level of certainty how those things are going to operate. And I can maybe say, well, I can't get it down to the exact dollar, but I can tell you in the one, the poor are going to be better off, but the rich are going to be dramatically worse off because we've worked out our level of taxation or how much money we're going to put into policing or whatever it is for the underlying structures. But we can point at the differences in distribution. If what you care about is things for their greatest benefit of those at the bottom, well, the thing that is for their greatest benefit is the thing that you must pick, even if it's to the massive detriment of everybody else. So we don't have to look at the particular numbers and sort of quibble about that. And you can buy there's some uncertainty as to how the systems are going to generate those results. But if you think there's no correlation between the way you organize those systems and the results, well, then Rawls has got a very different problem. That's a very good question. As you elaborated the, the scenarios, you elaborated the re response on Parfit's behalf, you talked about where else we might put the money, 
when you talked about putting money into policing, presumably have in mind putting money into other social services. I guess I would just want to know how much worse off the well-off are and by what metric. It may be that in a just society, there aren't billionaires. That could happen. It might even be that in a just society, there aren't people with nine-figure fortunes. Maybe there aren't even people with eight-figure fortunes. Is that really such an absurd consequence? If an awful lot of the wealth of a society goes not only to making the least well-off as well-off as they can be, but to the kind of public services, policing, education, public transport, public health, clean water, clean air, and the other things that I, I presume you had in mind as you, as you spelled things out. I mean, so it seems to me that the, the more the scenario gets spelled out, the less clear it is that the distribution is absurd. I'm very curious about the second principle. So the way I've heard it spelt out is slightly different, which would have very different implications. And I, I, I think it's worth spelling out these two different interpretations of sure. this principle. So the one way of spelling it out is the way you have, which is that when there's inequalities, those inequalities should be distributed in such a way that the people at the bottom get as much as possible so that they benefit the people at the bottom the most. The other way that that, that principle could be spelt out is that the people at the bottom must have at least enough, where at least enough is vague. You know, we have to assess what that is. And the people in the original position will have that debate. But in other words, it does cap what the people at the bottom need, the necessary amount. Whereas on your interpretation, there's no cap other than the cap would be, you know, that they don't have more than the people at the top because then they would no longer be at the bottom. So it's a kind of conceptual cap, but there's no, there's no absolute value cap. Whereas on my interpretation, there would be because you're saying, well, they must just have enough. And then we just need to define what enough is. I, I, and, and those two interpretations of the principle would yield very different societies. So on my interpretation, it would be the kind of society where the people at the bottom have their basic rights and basic needs fulfilled, whereas in your society, they would require more than that. And I'm wondering whether your version of this principle, and when I say your version, it might just be the correct version. It might be exactly what Rawls said, and I've just mis misinterpreted here. I wonder whether that version doesn't just imply something very much like communism, where everyone has the same amount. Sorry, you want to know whether the version that I'm attributing to Rawls implies something like communism? Okay, let me start with the, the question of how the second principle is to be interpreted. Uh, my own view is that, is that what I said Rawls said is what he says, but the textual point is less important than the philosophical one. So suppose that instead of saying, yeah, maybe that's a plausible interpretation of Rawls, that you've offered. I instead say, well, it's not an interpretation of Rawls, but it's an interesting and plausible principle and one to which a lot of people are drawn. Why wouldn't the parties in the original position choose some kind of sufficientarian principle? In fact, Jeremy Waldron has a really interesting version of the argument for just this. So one of the arguments that Rawls gives in the original position is an argument that turns on what Rawls calls the strains of commitment. So Rawls says, if the parties are considering utilitarianism, they'll see that they might have to make great sacrifices. Some of them might have to make great sacrifices so that others can have more and utility will be maximized. That imposes a great strain on the people who have to make sacrifices and will lead to their alienation. Okay. So Waldron thinks this is an argument that does a great deal of work for Rawls. And he says, I think quite cleverly, well, why not just deploy teams of social scientists to find out just at what point the strains kick in. Set the sufficientarian floor above that. You don't have alienation. And then maximize utility or average utility, total utility or whatever above that. Okay. Other versions of the argument you were offering are those for various forms of welfare capitalism. Rawls calls these mixed conceptions. And he doesn't pay as much attention to them in theory of justice as he might. He later tries to defend the, the difference principle, as I've interpreted it, against sufficientarian principles or against welfare capitalism. I mean, on the grounds that in welfare capitalism, the people who are the beneficiaries of wealth or, or state largesse aren't treated as full participants in, in the economy or in society. They're instead treated as people who have lost out, people who are victims, people who need a safety net because of inability or misfortune. And 
since the driving idea of Rawls's view is, I think, that of a society in which people treat one another as free and equal. He thinks that a, a society whose philosophical basis is, or a justification for welfare benefits is, some people are unable, some people lose, some people are victims, isn't a society in which, or he worries that it's not a society in which people are, can stand to one another as free and equal. A further argument against sufficientarianism that, that he offers, and that I find compelling anyway, is that if we allow great inequalities that are unconstrained by the previous two principles, maybe this isn't what you had in mind, then the worry is that people with uh, great amounts of income and wealth can convert those into other advantages, political power, or, for example, or greater opportunities for their children than other children enjoy. So, so one worry is the way in which people who have to be supported by a social safety net are regarded. Another is that if we just have a sufficientarian principle unconstrained by strong constraints or requirements of equality of opportunity and equal political liberty, that eventually power and advantage will flow to those with the greatest resource. So there's a different kind of critique of roles, which is not about thinking about the consequences that could ensue. It's from a rights perspective. So I'm thinking of Robert Nozick's libertarian position where he says, look, people are self-owners. You own yourself uh, and you own the products of your labor. And if you interfere with the products of someone's labor, really you're, you're interfering with their basic rights. And he describes something like uh, redistributive taxation as amounting to theft and slavery. He says you're forcing someone to work for the benefit of others against their will, and you are taking things for the benefit of others that do not belong to those people. And so if we think that one of the primary drivers of a Rawlsian society really is this taking from the rich to benefit the, the poor and the vulnerable, and I was just going to say, well, maybe that does yield, you know, better consequential results. Maybe that would be a good society to live in, but it's not just. You have interfered with people's fundamental rights. And on that basis, there's a side constraint that operates and you ought not to be doing that. So I think Nozix is a great book. And the critiques of Rawls that he develops are very imaginative. It's the best working out of the libertarian position that I know of. There may be others out there that are more compelling, but I, I think it's the best and it's the one that I, I love to teach. But in the end, I, I don't find it a, a compelling view. And I don't because, and I, this is Rawls's response, that transactions between people, like transactions between employers and employees, or between people who entertain and those who pay to be entertained, to take another example of, of Nozick's, that those transactions all take place against background institutions that themselves have to be fair. If we allow the unlimited accumulated, uh, accumulation of wealth by free transactions, we're going to end up in a society in which some people have objectionable amounts of power um, over others, or objectionable, amount, uh, objectionable amounts of power to influence the course of society and that, that others lack. And so to take examples from so the entertainment industry, the world of sports, the world of finance, people who build up vast fortunes are going to end up with a great deal of political power. And so are their descendants for a couple of generations. They, they and their descendants are going to enjoy opportunities and advantages that compromise what seem to me very powerful intuitions about fair equality of opportunity. And so the, the ability of people freely to transact has to be constrained by principles of background justice, or so it seems to, so Rawls argues, and so it seems. I worry about this sort of fixation on inequality. So in other words, it just is the case that people are born with natural abilities where they are more talented than other people. People are going to, through their own hard efforts, acquire more wealth than others. They're going to freely give that money to people that they choose, and you're gonna have different amounts uh, of things. The question is, why that is in and of itself bad. What seems bad to me is when people are suffering, when people are so poverty stricken that they are unable to lead lives of their choosing. And so you might want to be able to ameliorate some of those kinds of harms. But it seems that a lot of people aren't aimed at assisting those that are vulnerable. They just hate the rich. They hate this idea that you could have someone like Jeff Bezos 
who has untold fortunes of money, and that they like the idea of punishing that person or restricting their capital. The kind of common claim is to say, you've got these 50 mega wealthy people who have more wealth than the bottom 50% of society, and that's a bad thing. I think that's an unbelievably impressive thing, and that those people not they haven't just they're not sitting on these piles of wealth like Smaug the dragon. It's not like sitting on a pot of gold. That money is being utilized in the economy. If you think about how many jobs have been created by someone like Bill Gates indirectly, how many people work on a computer that runs Microsoft programs that have been able to start up small businesses on Amazon. Jason, for example, is a novelist who sells his books on Amazon that couldn't have existed were it not for these mega rich people who are motivated by power, by lust for being the best. And that happens to lead to a society that's incredibly prosperous. If you think about societies that want to cap the best, they're often not particularly innovative. Maybe people lead decent lives in those societies, but I'm not sure if I was to pick from a veil of ignorance to which society to be in, I think I'd want to pick the one where you've got the very wealthy innovators where there's some in income inequality than the one where everyone is kind of drab and in the middle. If it really is true that the use of talent and innovation and entrepreneurial skill makes everyone better off, then we're heading in the right direction from Ross's point of view, right? So, so there isn't an objection to people making use of their, their talents. And there is an objection to people accumulating. What there is an objection to is people doing so without benefit to others. And Nozick wants to say, it's my money. It's my hard work. You have no entitlement to it whatsoever. I owe you nothing. Why do you think you have a right over my stuff, over my time, over my body? You don't. You have a right to your stuff, to your body, to your time. On what basis can you say, you owe this to me. It would be nice if you gave it to me. It'd be nice if there was more opportunities for me, but to say that I have it as a right, why? Because people, people do not make their money in a Lockean state of nature. People make their money in a society that's highly structured by laws. For example, laws that are enforced in which violations of laws are, are prosecuted. Banking integrity is maintained. I mean, there's a, there's a reason that Jeff Bezos wouldn't want to set up shop in in Russia or in some third world kleptocracy. And it's not just that the taxes are high, it's that the conditions for, for capitalizing on his talents and building a business just aren't there. In order to build a business, you have to take advantage of a lot of public goods that are available in this country, the rule of law, the many government services for which we merely ask that people be willing to pay. Now, once you recognize that people are willing to pay, once you recognize the taxation isn't just forced labor, then the only really interesting question is how high the tax rate should be. So I'm very proud of Mark for, for representing my position as a free market capitalist. <laughs> and now I'm going to try and represent his for a little bit, which is the animal rights. If, if we've got a whole bunch of agents sitting at this table in the original position, presumably animals aren't agents who can have these discussions. And so it seems like their interests will be set aside. By the way, I eat meat, but Mark doesn't. But given that Mark's playing the free, free market capitalist here, I feel like it's important to give the animals a voice. If you play the vegetarian as well as he plays the free market capitalist, I'm in trouble. The question is, what is to stop all of the people in the original position, given that, let's assume for a moment, they're people, from saying, well, when, we, when this veil, veil of ignorance lifts, none of us will be animals. We'll all be humans. And there's nothing that would reduce our well-being or, or frustrate our interests if we had a state where animal rights were entirely irrelevant or non-existent, where we could torture and maim and eat animals at will. What, what is to stop such a, a state from being the one that Rawls recommends? Because Rawls offered a really powerful theory, people want it to be a theory of everything. It's a theory of basic justice, a basic distributive justice. He extends it to the international sphere late in his career, but and develops an account of international justice, but it's really an account of domestic distributive justice. There are lots of other really interesting and important moral questions that the theory isn't designed to address. So it doesn't address how human beings should treat a lot of nature, not just animals. But it's not obvious, for example, that there's anything in the theory that prevents prevent paving over the Grand Canyon in Arizona. But but that doesn't mean that there aren't 
very powerful ethical considerations that tell against doing it. It just means that those ethical considerations are not yielded by an account of distributive justice. So I think what's interesting there is this distinction between morality and political legitimacy. So, you know, I, I agree with you. It seems immoral to treat animals abominably. I agree with you. But we might want more than just a moral pronunciation. So we might want to say more than just it is wrong to treat animals this way. We might want a, a law. And it seems like if Rawls's position is not going to address whether we should have those kinds of laws or not, then it's just incomplete. And, and that's a, a big problem. It's not, just, it's not just that it doesn't discuss it, but we would need some reason why we should include those laws. And those reasons, it seems, can't be generated from the original position, which then begs the question, where do those reasons come from to have those laws? And wherever that is, might start to generate reasons that conflict with his views on human conduct. And then we've got this competing system of laws. I take Rawls's theory to be an attempt to show how the central elements of a liberal democratic constitution are to be justified. And that requires him to say something about the grounds of the basic rights and liberties. And he, and he thinks to say, and I think he's right about this, to say something about opportunities and about the distribution of income and wealth, even though other people in the social contract tradition, with the exception of Rousseau, I guess, have had less to say about that. There's also, Rawls also defends a, a principle of legitimacy. And it says roughly that exercises of power are legitimate if they're in accord with a, demo, with a liberal democratic constitution. If they're in accord, leaves room for an awful lot of ordinary legislation to get passed. Legislation that doesn't bear on the essentials of a constitution or in matters of basic justice. Once, we, once the matter, central matters of basic justice and the basic liberties are settled, then we can go on to discuss other political questions. And lots of other moral considerations might be thought to bear on those questions that don't bear on the central ones. And, and so I think Rawls would say, and this seems right to me, questions about animal rights and questions about the tr treatment of the rest of nature are very, very important questions. They're not questions about that are, and even I, I think the staunchest, or few of the staunchest animal rights advocates would say, they're not questions that are central to the, to the writing of a liberal democratic constitution. They're important, but, and now maybe I'm wrong about this, but there aren't liberal democratic constitutions that I know that, that enshrine animal rights among the basic rights. What's interesting is how the utilitarians take a very different stance on this. The Benthamites and the millions, they just, you know, it's suffering. And suffering, regardless of the host that experiences that suffering, the suffering matters. So they seem to start from a very different stance. Now, it is a moral theory rather than a political theory, although it's been used in ways to generate political theories. But it's just interesting to me how Rawls's position kind of uh, sidesteps that. I take your point that that's just not his focus. The reason I raised animals is because it does lead into another problem. And that is, if we think that there's certain parties that won't be represented adequately at the table in the original position, like animals, perhaps there's certain human parties as well. So I'm just curious what Rawls would say about the rights of certain religious groups, for example, especially if they're very small religious groups. And given that when the veil of ignorance is lifted, it's very unlikely that you'll be a member of those very small religious groups. What is to stop the people in the original position from forming a law that severely discriminates against those um, smaller groups? I understand given your two principles that couldn't happen, but my question is why would those two principles occur and in their stead, not some sort of law that severely discriminates against a tiny group, which would be very unlikely that I would be a part of. So that's a very good question. But let me, if I may, return to the point you made about utilitarianism, because I mean, you've put your finger on the reason that utilitarianism seems so compelling a view. I mentioned that Rawls took it as his, as his foil, it's the beast that he thought had to be slain, but he took it as his foil because it has such a powerful hold. And it has a powerful hold because it is in many ways a very appealing view. It's an appealing view in part because it's 
sensitive to the amount of suffering there is, and it enjoins doing something about it. The problem with utilitarianism, of course, is that or the problem we're all solved with utilitarianism is that it allows for trade-offs. Some people can be made to suffer so that others will be better off. Okay. And, and that he thinks is a real worry. If the way to maximize utility is to impose a bit of suffering on some people so that others can have much more, that's what justice requires. So the sensitivity to suffering, the desire to alleviate it, and the desire to raise the amount of utility there is in a society is on the one hand, the source of its appeal, but on closer examination, the source of its vulnerability. Now to the question about, about small religious minorities. So parties in the original position, as Rawls has set it up, don't know what religious group, if any, they will belong to. They might belong to a populous one. They might belong to a small one. They might belong to none at all. Not knowing what size group they will belong to, but caring greatly about their liberty, they will make a choice that protects the liberty of everyone. So they don't ask themselves, what are the chances that I'm going to be in a large group or a small, or that I'm going to be a member of an adherent of this religion or that? Nor do they calculate probabilities and make choices based on expected value, right? They don't know who they're going to be. They recognize that whoever they are, they will want rights and liberties. And so they protect everyone's. I'm, I'm just curious about that. I mean, why aren't they calculating probability? So if I was in this position, I imagine the set of properties that I have as being like a deck of cards. I've got a hand in front of me and I don't know what is in that hand until I turn over the cards. Now I would card count, right? So I would look at the deck. I would see the information that's been revealed to me. And I'd say, well, the likelihood of me having a jack of spades is three and seven, whatever it is. And that, that will guide my reasoning around rules that involve the jack of spades. I would perform that calculation in that position. So you're in the original position and you're trying to make a decision and you ask which principles should I pick? You think, well, what are my chances of belonging to such and such a religious group? Well, you'd have to know what religious groups there are in a society. And the dealer says to you, I'm not gonna tell you. Which religious groups are big? And the dealer says, I'm not going to tell you. Are there 52 religious groups? Okay. Are there four religious groups? The spades, the clubs, the hearts, and the diamonds? I'm not going to tell you. We have no idea. And so there's no basis for calculating probabilities in the original position. Now, you might think that just shows that the veil of ignorance is a bad way to set things up because rational choice demands the use of expected values. That's another conversation. But if the question is, why don't parties behind the veil of ignorance count cards and calculate probabilities? The answer is they've got no information on the basis of which to do so. And you might think what religious groups develop in a society, what occupations people pursue in a society, what avocations people pursue in a society are posterior to choice in the original position. They depend on how society is structured. And so it's not just that the dealer isn't going to divulge information about a society which is already, as it were, out there, is that there isn't yet anything to be known until the choice in the original position is made. So it seems that there's a difference if we're thinking about expected value and what the chances are of certain things occurring when you're dealing with things that are costless. So for example, it doesn't cost anyone to subscribe to a rule of mutual respect. So if you say, okay, well, we're just going to allow people to practice their faiths in a manner that doesn't interfere with the rights of others, there's no cost in that. Maybe there's some kind of offense cost, some sense of, I don't really like these people are doing these things, but it doesn't cost you anything. Imagine that you're a, a hospital administrator and you're trying to work out which kinds of doctors you should employ, which specialists you should have, how many are cancer specialists or blood specialists, what kinds of machinery you ought to have. And so you say, well, I want to know what the distributions are of uh, cancer in a society or of blood disease or of ALS or of dementia. And the dealer says, I'm not going to tell you. Well, it seems like you'd probably build a pretty bad hospital. You'd build a hospital 
in the dark, not knowing what are the things that are that, that are there to prioritize. You might think, well, I guess I better get a decent mix of everything given the limited resources that I have. So you spend accordingly and then you find out. And it turns out that some diseases are incredibly rare and you spent a lot of money getting specialist doctors and special equipment to treat it. And it was probably not going to help very often. And you completely undercapitalized on a bunch of areas where they were very prevalent. So we think that the veil is very bad for the distribution of those kinds of things. And that's something that seems that Rawls cares about is the distribution of goods for the benefit of people. Do you want to lift the veil in some areas and not others? The short answer is yes, you do. So there's no claim that the original position is an appropriate device for making every decision or lots of decisions, even lots of important decisions, even lots of important decisions about justice. It's a specialized device, the social contract is a specialized device developed to answer a particular question, a particular problem. But you're quite right that, that asking people who have to make very important decisions about the allocation of scarce resources in the face of a pressing social problem should not make it veiled in ignorance. They should know something about the problem that they have to address. They shouldn't use the Maximin rule, which is the rule that parties that Rawls says parties in the original position would use to decide among principles of justice. So just to say a little bit more about that, Rawls not only imagines that the parties in the original position are veiled in ignorance of their abilities, attributes, and conceptions of the good, he also thinks that in the situation in which they find themselves, given how high the stakes are, the rational thing to do is to be extremely risk averse. And so the rational thing to do is to pick the set of principles that offer the best worst outcome. This takes us back to the Parfit objection, right? The Parfit objection compared to distributions. And in developing the objection, you quite rightly pointed out that Rawls would say, we have to pick the distribution with the best worst outcome or that leaves the least well off as well off as they can be, even if the outcome for the best pales in comparison to the outcome that the best off could enjoy were a different choice made, right? So in, in focusing on or in, in asking parties in the original position to focus just on how well off the least off, well off are, and to make them as well off as possible, he's saying that the party should use a rule called maximin, that they should look at, they should pick the, the uh, option with the best worst outcome. That is not a principle it is rational to use in very many circumstances at all. Circumstances have to be really special for that to be a rational a principle of rational choice, a, a rational principle of choice to use. Okay? The original position is such a situation there may interestingly be some others. Cass Sunstein just published a book in which he argues that there are some policy situations in which maximin is a defensible principle of choice. Interesting little book. But he too concedes there aren't many situations in which this is so. The conditions are special. The situation of the hospital administrator, not one of them. It seems like the rules you're going to choose for your society depend upon external constraints. So it seems like the rules you want to choose for a society in which there's very scarce resources and perhaps a raging pandemic and maybe bloodthirsty hordes just beyond your borders would be very different from the rules of a society where there's abundance, no pandemic, and no bloodthirsty hordes, and no zombies at your, at, your, at your doorstep. It seems like the rules you'd want to construct in those two societies are different. So... There's two related questions here. The one is, should the people, should those agents in the original position know what those external constraints are? And the second is, given that, would the rules that they choose in these different circumstances be different, or is there just one perfect society? The, the theory of justice is developed for a fairly limited purpose. I didn't spell that out as well as I might have, but Rawls is writing for societies under conditions of what he calls moderate scarcity, under modern conditions of moral and religious pluralism. He's not developing an account of lifeboat ethics. He isn't developing an account of justice for a society of limitless plenty, if such a society would indeed need an account of justice, nor is he developing an account of justice for a society that's freely united around a, a certain religion or conception of the good. So the, the circumstances of the society that he is addressing are really important. And you've, you've put your finger on one. Scarcity has to be moderate and the society secure. And 
he adds, the, soci the societies for which he's writing are importantly heirs to a long tradition of liberal democratic thought. So I'd like to touch on something that you hinted at, this idea of a pluralistic society where people have very different notions of the good. And one way we can think about that is people's different religions. So people have very different ideas of which deity one ought to worship or which particular rituals one ought to engage in. What is the Rawlsian view on how you accommodate these different visions of the good life? Well, the most important, I suppose, are the two principles, which uh, the first of which guarantees freedom of religion. But freedom of religion is, of course, quite abstract, and an awful lot of questions, more fine-grained questions, can arise in a society's political life. As you may know, in the States, we have both a free exercise clause and a non-establishment clause. The First Amendment of our Constitution allows uh, both the Congress and, by extension, state governments, the extension came later, the state governments will not make laws prohibiting the free exercise of religion, but neither can government establish a church. The interpretation of these two clauses is endlessly vexed. And Rawls actually doesn't talk about the two clauses specifically, though I think it's quite clear he would endorse both, both non-establishment and free exercise. But when they conflict, how they're to be balanced, what we do with vexatious particular questions is a matter on which he's largely silent. He did very briefly address one question that came up in an American Supreme Court case some years ago, a case called Wisconsin versus Yoder. The case involved an Amish family that wanted to pull their children, as the old order Amish are a, society, a religious group in the States that believes in living apart from the modern world. They live a simple, largely agricultural life. And Amish families in Wisconsin wanted to pull their children out of high school. They didn't object to the children going to a, to their children going to a, a state established grade school, but they didn't want them to go to a large government established high school. And the Supreme Court decided in favor of the Amish. Rawls said something that suggested he was somewhat sympathetic to the decision. He thought it important that, that children, regardless of the religion in which they're raised, know that they have the right of exit know that heresy isn't a crime, know that, know something of the, the modern world, but not that they'd be exposed to it in the way that they would be high school. At least that's what the couple of sentences that he wrote about it suggest. But he doesn't get into the details of those very vexed jurisprudential questions. Rawls also talks about political liberalism, not just within one state, but amongst other states. And he thinks about how you can have let's say Western democracies that generally abide by liberal democratic principles. You can then have, let's say, evil dictatorships. So those that are totalitarian fascists that don't respect anyone's rights. And those that, let's say, are non-liberal, they don't abide by liberal values, but they're also not acting in a manner which is oppressive of their own citizens. What is his vision for how you would have this global community of states and how that ought to operate? That's a good question. And it's a question that concerns the part of his theory about which I know the least. But you're quite right that he identifies different... So maybe I should start by saying this, that while some people who are concerned with international justice want to develop principles that would regulate, as it were, an international basic structure or international institutions, and um, want to develop theories that enjoin something like the difference principle across borders. Rawls doesn't think of the questions about international justice in that way. Instead, he conceives of the questions of international justice as being questions about what the foreign policy of a just liberal democracy ought to be. And he distinguishes four kinds of societies, actually. There are the well-ordered liberal democracies. There are, as you say, outlaw states. There are burdened societies, societies that are devoid of human capital or natural resources or because of corrupt and inept governance are greatly impoverished. And, and then there are what he imagines, what he calls decent consultation hierarchies. And these are societies of the sort that you described last, societies in which there is some religious diversity. That's his example. Um, there is a dominant religion and the religion that is dominant enjoys a privileged position, but there's still a, a common good conception of justice, that is the government operates for the good of all, the 
members of minority religions are consulted. There's a consultation hierarchy. They're not completely shut out of positions of power or opportunities, but the dominant religion holds a dominant position. And it is his view, and not everybody agrees with this, but I think he's right about this, that it's that a liberal, just liberal democracy shouldn't interfere with the internal arrangements of a society like that. What will happen to a society like that under forces of globalization is, an, is itself an interesting question. Who knows what the long-term trajectory of such societies will be and whether the long-term trends of globalization will lead to their liberalization, we just don't know. But he doesn't think, he doesn't speculate about that. And he doesn't say that it's the business of liberal societies to interfere with the internal affairs of societies of that kind. There are some societies in which you can interfere. So the one might be for those societies that, as you say, are, are vulnerable societies, that you might have a positive obligation to assist them through some kind of uh, global justice fund. And the other one might be that for those tyrannical societies, that you might have an obligation to protect those citizens through, let's say, military intervention. There are, there are going to be cases in our history where that's happened. American troops arriving in, in Nazi Germany and freeing people from concentration camps, we think of as being a, a good case where a state loses its serenity rights um, because they've done something so heinous against their own citizens. Where you get to step beyond the realms of protecting your own citizens as a liberal democracy ought to be narrow, but there might be some cases where you're obliged to do so if you don't mind my saying so, the case you picked is kind of an easy one because Nazi Germany lost justly waged defensive war, right? I mean, they're, they're an offending party. And, and so it wasn't simply a matter of our crossing their borders and intervening to assist citizens who were, who were being oppressed. It was a matter of Nazi Germany waging a war which they lost. I mean, harder cases are, I suppose, societies like North Korea to take a clear case. And... I don't remember exactly what you may have to leave this in the cutting room floor. I don't remember exactly what Rawls says about them. It seems to me what he should say is that, well, there may be clear cases of oppression. They're not easy cases. It's not easy to know what to do about a, a society like that. We can sanction it, apply diplomatic pressure, try and get the regimes that support them to cut off their support. But, and here I'm going beyond anything that that he says or anything that can be extrapolated from the text an outlaw regime that not only oppresses its citizens but is sitting on a large amount of fissionable material hard to know what to do about that beyond sanctions is military intervention really a good idea given the chaos it would induce the starvation it might produce and nuclear the nuclear war it might unleash the constrained nuclear war it might unleash it's not obvious what a just liberal society should do about an outlaw state like that. A lot of what we've discussed has had to do with the rules that Rawls thinks will come up with in the original position as the agents involved. I'm curious now, let's, let's assume the rules that he suggests that we come up with are the rules that we do. Now the question is the veil of ignorance lifts. Why do we follow those rules? Why is the original position so compelling that if we find ourselves in a position that would be better or we'd be better off if we didn't follow the rules, why should we now follow them? You're certainly quite right that if an agreement is reached in the original position, that people would defect from it as soon as they exited the original position, then the agreement isn't, to steal a phrase from Ronald Dworkin, isn't worth the paper it isn't written on. So we have to have some reason to think that parties will abide by the agreement that they have reached. And this brings me to a second interesting thought experiment. If we think of Rawls's original position as a bookend, one side of the history of political philosophy, the Ring of Gyges is a thought experiment that bookends, as it were, the beginning of political philosophy. The Ring of Gyges is found in Plato's Republic. Plato's brother Glaucon, one of the interlocutors in the Republic, tells the tale of the Ring of Gyges. The Ring of Gyges is a ring found by a shepherd, Gyges, and when the shepherd discovers it, he discovers that the ring confers invisibility. And he dons the ring and performs all kinds of unjust acts, rape, theft, steals power as well as money. The thought experiment posed by the Ring of Gyges is, is what would you do 
if you had the ring of Gyges? Would you behave justly or not? And the question that the ring of Gyges raises, the real question that this thought experiment raises is the question of whether it's good to be just. If it's good to be just, if it's better to be just than unjust, then you won't behave as Gyges did. But one of the hardest problems in moral philosophy is showing that it's, it's good to be just. And that is a problem, one form of which Rawls tackles in the third part of, of Theory of Justice. And I often say that for all the differences between Rawls and Hobbes, they have one thing in common, and that is that people read the first part of their books when the social, up to the point at which the social contract gets written, and then they neglect the rest. The rest of Hobbes' is Leviathan is terrific, well worth reading. The rest of Theory of Justice, even more so. So in the third part of Theory of Justice, Rawls gives an argument, I think a, a very imaginative argument, what he regarded as his favorite part of the book, that people who grow up in a well-ordered society would find it good to be just. Somewhat more specifically, he argues that people in a well-ordered society would acquire a sense of justice, that is, that they would acquire a desire to do what's right, and they would, on reflection, find that being just comports with or is congruent with their own view of the good. So he thinks that whatever diverse views of the good people in a just and liberal society might have, their views of the good will at least converge on a few goods that they can have only if they're just people. The, uh, to step back a bit, put it a bit more generally, the institutions of a just society shape those who live under them so that they accept the principles and they think it's good that they do. Rawls was really impressed with the history of religious toleration. Three or four centuries ago, people thought, you just can't live with those whose religious views are different than yours. We have to try and convert them forcibly if necessary. We have to try and stamp out heresy. People don't think that anymore. And not only do people think that stamping out heresy and religious intoleration are wrong, we also think you know, it's, it's good to be tolerant. And religious views have come around to incorporate the principle of toleration. So the religious views of the good support the injunction of justice that says, tolerate those of different religions. That's an example, I think, of what Rawls thought would happen in a just, well-ordered society, one well-ordered by his, by his principles.